All right, guys, so today we're going to dive into developing and organizing the presentation. So specifically in this class, we are going to be focusing on our career research presentation. So that's where you have gone and interviewed someone in the field that you would like to pursue with your degree. And then you're going to present your findings to us online via Zoom. So that'll be the first one. And then we'll also end our semester with a sales presentation that you'll get more details on as the semester rolls. But knowing that these things are coming up, we'll start to uh, prepare those presentations and think about organizational methods, how to connect to our audience, how to gain attention, all those things. So this might be um, a brief review of your public speaking course, specifically if you've taken that course through UW. But I want to make sure that we hit on those things again as we start to prepare our outlines for presentations as well. So first of all, holistically, business presentations can be pervasive, meaning that uh, they can affect and reach a wide spread of people, especially in corporations, um, business settings, those kinds of things. Obviously, you will also have um, kind of a roundtable setting a lot where you are just chatting with people in your department or in um, your level of the company, those those uh, types of situations. But you'll also, as this says, work your way up within companies. And then these business presentations become more and more uh, prevalent and you are more and more often the speaker in those situations. So business presentations are more important as careers progress and as you gain uh, power and knowledge within uh, your job and your, your field. Uh, these can be formal or informal, like I just talked about, where you can be in a very corporate setting or um, in a sales pitch type of setting, or they can be more informal where you're presenting within uh, a group uh, to the people that you work with daily, um, have desks next to, all that stuff. And this may accept uh, may affect acceptance of ideas. So how well we are able, able to portray our ideas uh, will likely lead to how well they are accepted um, and pursued within, within an organization. So we talk about empowerment in public speaking, and that's the ability to actually share your ideas. And we talk about how two brains is better than one because we want to be able to learn and glean and bounce ideas off of one another and share what is in our heads, share the knowledge and ideas that we have. So that is where it may affect acceptance of ideas, how well we can organize our thoughts. You can have internal or external audiences, meaning sometimes you may be talking to people outside of your organization about the organization or company, and then you're also going to always be presenting and communicating within your company organization. There's different kinds of presentations, and different kinds of presentations meet different demands. So we'll talk about the different organizational patterns you can have to reflect those situations, uh, to present the information to the best of your ability, and have the audience be the most receptive to that information. So first of all, we have to analyze the situation in order to fit the presentation to that situation. And this largely relies on our audience. So we need to know who are the key members in our audience, how much do they already know about the topic that you are pursuing, what will they want to know about the topic, so what might be missing or what new ideas do you have to share, and then are what are personal preferences, so how do people um, in that situation like to receive the message, how are you best at delivering the message, uh, will a Skype session suffice or do you actually need to travel um, and make that face-to-face -face, uh, communication that way? So thinking even in that setting, now we're much more global, much more virtual, what is going to work best there? What is going to be the most economic? What is going to make the best connection? All those things. Then we need to think about their demographics. So we need to address gender, we need to address the age of our audience, cultural background, and economic status. So specifically, if you are talking to someone uh, from another country, if you are doing that global, like we talked about, cross-cultural communication, does that change how you approach the setting? If you are talking to an elderly group of people, maybe a Skype session, uh, a Zoom session isn't going to work as well. Maybe you actually need to go and meet those people uh, just for technology reasons, adapting to technology. Maybe they're not uh, to the same level that you are, and that is stereotyping on my end, thinking, that, thinking in the elderly that way. But uh, that's just an example, right? Most uh, especially very elderly people are not going to be able to use computers quite as well. Um, also hard of hearing, hard of sight, those kinds of things. So we have to always think about uh, the age of our audience, the background of our audience, 
um, economic status, depending on the topic we're talking about. Um, gender, gender is kind of a hot topic in uh, society today, so we always have to be conscious of that um, and, and structure our language in an inclusive manner, right? Another example is age with children. So you would approach children in a much different manner than you would um, a colleague, right? You have to adjust your language, adjust your speaking style, adjust the type of visual information you incorporate. So all of those things we have to think about even before we begin uh, preparing our presentation. Other uh, audience considerations are the group size. So if you're speaking to a huge lecture hall of people, maybe you need a microphone, and we'll talk about the context of things as well. Uh, maybe you need to have uh, much larger inclusive examples if you have a larger group. Maybe you really know the people that you're talking to, so you can tailor your examples to them. Um, also thinking about attitudes, attitudes toward the speaker. So how does that audience feel about you and the topic you are going to be addressing? How do they feel towards the subject? So weighing all of those things as you start to prepare. Are they more hostile towards you and the topic at hand? Uh, depending on that situation, are they very familiar and uh, curious about the topic and what you are presenting? Uh, do they know you well? Do they not know you at all? How much detail do you need to go in there? All right, so we also have to consider the beliefs and values of our audience members. So attitudes are kind of our likes and dislikes, and those are the easiest things to change. So uh, maybe you had a bad experience at a restaurant, so you dislike the restaurant, um, and then maybe they run a special and you decide you'll give it one more try and you go back and you really love their new dish. So that changes your attitude towards the restaurant. Uh, maybe you've are always favored or your family has always favored one brand of toothpaste, so you favor and buy that one brand of toothpaste. That's an attitude towards a product. Very simple example, but also very easy to change, right? We're kind of swaying. We're not really set in our ways as much with attitudes. Then we have beliefs and values. So beliefs are what we believe to be true or false. Um, these have a little bit more weight with us, what we believe to be true or false, and take more persuasion but they can be moved. So in public speaking, again, we talk about this as like your anchor in social judgment theory, where uh, with attitudes, your anchor can be moved pretty easily, thinking about like a ship's anchor. Beliefs, it takes a little more tugging to make it happen, to change your thought process into what is true, what is false. And then values are those enduring concepts, concepts where your anchor is just pretty set and it's what you believe to be right or wrong. So for example, child abuse is wrong, killing someone is wrong. And I've had students argue <laughs> killing someone might not be wrong in certain situations and whatever else, but that is the overall consensus when we think about that, right? That killing somebody is wrong, child abuse is wrong. You're not going to convince me otherwise in a short speech at least. It would probably take a very long time and lots of examples to change my mind on that if ever, right? So attitudes are those things that are easier to change. Uh, they're pretty flexible in people's minds. And those are the things that we're typically shooting for um, in, in our presentations. Maybe touching on beliefs sometimes uh, to address something that's true or false and uh, change people's viewpoints that way. We also need to analyze your, the situation in terms of yourself as the speaker. So what is your goal? What is your knowledge at that point in time? And what are your feelings about the topic? Sometimes we have to kind of gather in and harness our own feelings so that we can speak about the topic objectively and with clear knowledge towards a um, honest and tolerant goal for our audience, right? Um, your feelings about the topic may drive you to even speak on the topic. So maybe we need to harness those in that way as well. Uh, do you need to do more research or do you have all of the knowledge? Are you an expert on that field? Um, so always just address what you know as a speaker as you go into the situation too. Then there's the occasion which I started to touch on um, with the group size. What kind of facility will you be in when you present? Will you have uh, the technology that you need in that setting? Will there be a projector if you're doing a PowerPoint? You think that those things are always just going to be provided, but let me tell you, sometimes they're not and you're kind of left in the lurch. So always analyze the situation. Where will you be? Do you need a microphone in that setting? All that good stuff.
Time is also very important. So what hour of the day are you speaking? So for instance, if you have 8 a.m. class, are you as alert as if you have 11 a.m. class? If you have 11 a.m. class, it's getting close to lunch. Have you eaten breakfast? Are you hungry? Is that clouding the message? Uh, is it later in the evening? Are people worried about what's going on at home when they're there at your presentation? Are they getting tired? Did they have a long day? So all those things play in um, in terms of time and how well your message will be received. So you want to plan that as best as you can with that respective audience that you have to have uh, the most attention on you and your message at that time. The length of the presentation, we also want to make sure that that fits uh, within people's time constraints that you've set aside and making sure that we're not rambling, that we're being very concise and to the point in those settings. Context, so are there other speakers that day? Uh, are there current events going on that you need to reference? So just being aware of the whole situation as you go into your speech. All right, so the next piece I want to talk about is setting your goal and developing a thesis. So we have general goals, and there's three main goals. We call these your general purpose in public speaking, and you can either inform, you can persuade, or you can entertain. We don't typically touch on entertaining as much here because we're really focusing on what we'll be doing in the business setting. So if you're a comedian, maybe that is your business and your general purpose is largely going to be to inform all the time. But for most people, it's going to be to inform or to persuade. So our sales presentation will be that persuasive speech, and the informative will be on the career that you chose uh, to look into further with your career research presentation. So informative speeches, you're teaching something, you're defining a concept, uh, you're illustrating something, clarifying, or even training, okay? Persuasion, you're trying to get people to take action and to change those attitudes and sometimes those beliefs about certain topics as well. Then we have our goal statement. So this is a thesis statement. We call it a central idea. So central idea in this class, but it is your overall thesis statement. So your goal, to whom do you want to influence, what they should think or do, and how, when, and where you want them to do it. So here you're describing the reaction you're seeking out of your audience, and you want to be as specific as possible so that the audience knows what they are supposed to come away with in that specific example. So here, guys, your general purpose is kind of the overarching goal of the presentation, and then your thesis statement and your central idea are getting more into um, kind of the response that you want and the overall goal of the speech. Um, in a more specific sense, thinking about what the what you want the audience to come away with. So examples of the specific purpose here, what you want the audience to think, to do, think, feel, or remember, the reaction you want from the audience. This is also sometimes called the behavioral objective because it's literally the behavior you want the audience uh, to come away with. So I want who to do what and then how, when, and where. So you want to list, identify, explain, write. You want to use these active measurable verbs that make the audience physically give you that response. So a lot of times people will say, at the end of my speech, I want the audience to understand or I want the audience to know. Those are vague verbs, right? You don't really know if the audience understands or knows what you're talking about unless you ask them to physically describe, explain, list the points, something along those lines where you're actually calling for a response from the audience member. So here's an example. At the end of my speech, the audience will be able to identify two principles that will help them be successful in their first semester, ooh, I have fist, first semester of college. So we see there, there's an active measurable verb. We'll we're telling the audience what we want them to do, okay? And so specific purpose tips, specific purpose criteria, you want it to be measurable, like we just talked about with that verb. We want to limit to a single idea. We want to describe the reaction we're seeking, be as specific and realistic as possible. So here's a poor example. At the end of my speech, the audience will be able to know more about financial aid. Uh, maybe we change this, this to, at the end of my speech, the audience will be able to explain the three major types of financial aid provided by the University of Wyoming. Okay, So then we've set the tone and the situation and exactly what is to come. 
Okay, so now diving more specifically into that thesis statement, that central idea, which is going to be listed after your specific purpose. And I will show you an example here in a second that's in our modules. But the central idea of that thesis statement is a single sentence. We don't want to phrase it as a phrase. So avoid starting with question words like how. I see how a lot. So again, a single sentence summarizes the message using direct and specific language. We want to make sure after we've done all of this audience analysis that we work that into our central idea and make sure that our central idea is audience focused. And you're going to use this central idea multiple times in your presentation. So it is always part of the introduction. So you can even plan it at the top of your outline and then copy and paste it somewhere into your introductory paragraph. You're going to reiterate that central idea Idea, that thesis statement, that goal, oh, uh, several times in the body of the speech, hint at it at least, start to develop it, pull it apart, and then you're really going to reiterate it one more time in the conclusion to make sure that that audience comes away with that goal and is able to uh, take something away from it and reiterate it to you, apply it back to the specific purpose, and tell you what they've learned uh, in that presentation. So how do I write my central idea? I get this question a lot. Um, here's some uh, interesting tricks to help you think about how to write your central idea. So one, imagine that you met a member of your audience at the elevator and you only had a few seconds to explain your idea before the doors closed. So what would you say in that instance uh, if you just had to spit out the overall um, takeaway from the speech? What would you tell them? And then thinking about old school Twitter when you only had 140 characters to say your tweet, your message, what was the overall message there? You really had to play around with it to make sure that it fit in that space, right? What is the overall idea you need your audience members to come away with? So come back to that. Think of creative ways to think about it. If, you, if push came to shove, how would you explain uh, the overall goal of your speech, your presentation? Okay, so a central idea, a more advanced central idea, I would say, is a blueprint, but a normal central idea is not wrong by any means. So a blueprint also includes a preview of your main points. So an example of a straight central idea, which again is not wrong, but then you'll have to add in that blueprint later as a separate piece of the intro. Totally fine, sometimes that works better. Here's an example of just a central idea. The University of Wyoming is the best school to attend in the region. So then you would go on to give me a preview of what those points might be. A blueprint here would say the University of Wyoming is the best school to attend due to its low tuition, smaller class size, and reasonable cost of living. So there we know exactly what is to come in the body of the speech. The first main point is going to talk about lower tuition, second smaller class size, and the third the reasonable cost of living. Okay, so again central idea plus a preview is a blueprint. Example here for the whole shebang that we've talked about so far. So the topic might be the University of Wyoming, the general purpose to persuade, the specific purpose at the end of my speech, the audience will be able to list the three reasons why the University of Wyoming is the best for your institution in the region. The central idea, the University of Wyoming is the best school to attend due to its low tuition, smaller class size, and reasonable cost of living. So there you still uh, write it as the central idea, but knowing that you've taken it a step further, included that preview, and essentially made it a blueprint uh, of the speech to come. Organizing your speech here, you want to be sure that you have a clear and organized goal. So that goes back to all of this planning that you are doing in terms of your topic. You want to tell them what you are going to tell them. You want to tell them and you want to tell them what you told them. So here in the central idea, you are doing that. You are telling them what you are going to tell them in the body of the speech. In the body of the speech, you are actually telling them. You're explaining and providing support for those points. And then in the conclusion, you're going to review one more time and tell them what, the, what you told them throughout the speech, reiterate that, and really hit it home in the conclusion. Next, we'll talk about organizing the body of the speech, which if we've done that planning at the top of the page, uh, typically this part is easier. So we want to organize the body of the speech in two steps. So you want to identify the key points. And then based on those points, decide which, or, which organizational pattern fits best with those points and your overall goal. And we'll talk about organizational patterns here in a second. 
Brainstorming ideas, this might help you to identify key points and helps to identify support. So you might just want to get out all of the information that you have or that you've aggregated through research and have it all down and then figure out what is the best way I can package this for my specific audience with this time frame in this setting with this many people, etc. Uh, our basic organizational plan, again, you're going to have an introduction that has very key elements. You're going to have a body and you're going to have a conclusion. So we'll talk about the key elements more in depth in terms of the introduction and the conclusion here in a bit. But we're going to start with the body. So guys, I challenge you to start at the top of your page, write the general purpose, specific purpose, and the central idea, and then skip to the body. So oftentimes we want to just work down our page and do the intro of the body and the conclusion. But start in the body. The body is going to tell you how you should organize the speech, and then you can more effectively write the introduction to introduce that content and then wrap up that content. So it's nice to write the intro and conclusion kind of simultaneously so you can connect the two, and then you have to have the information in the body in order to do that most effectively. So we are going to start with the body here. First, you want to identify main points and subpoints. You can do this through your brainstorming, thinking about ideas, and from the research that you find. So a lot of it's going to be aggregating everything that you know, writing it all down, printing it all off, having it in a document, um, and then figuring out what are the main and key ideas that you're pulling out of that research and what uh, tidbits that you found help support those ideas. Uh, you want to choose the best organizational pattern. So for informative speeches, we're going to talk about four patterns, chronological, spatial, topical, and cause and effect. And we'll get to this, but cause and effect can be used for persuasion as well, but it also can be very effective in the informative lens if you keep your goal very informative. So cause and effect tends to lend itself a little bit to persuasion, and it's often used in persuasion, but our text talks about it in terms of the informative context too. So first of all, guys, you should be familiar with uh, the chronological pattern if you took public speaking from UW. So chronological deals in terms of steps, times, and sequence. So people often use a chronological organization when you're teaching somebody how to do something. It's where the first point or the first step must be done and understood before the next steps can be done. So for example, if I'm teaching how to make chocolate chip cookies, you have to actually gather the ingredients, mix the ingredients before you can bake the cookies and eat the cookies, right? So things have to come in a certain time or sequence. You can also use chronological on a timeline by telling like the history of something or someone, right? Uh, the next one we'll talk about is topical. So topical is based on natural or logical divisions. And I would say natural or logical divisions are more rare than you think. So that's like the branches of the U.S. federal government or the seasons of the year, something along those lines. Um, some topics do have uh, logical divisions to them. Um, but always being cautious that you're not just being lazy and labeling things as topical, that there's actually a rhyme or a reason to how you are presenting information that not only makes sense to you, but is very clear to your audience as well. If you think topical works best for your speech, I challenge you also to apply one of the three principles of topical to really narrow down the organization. So that's primacy, recency, and complexity. So for instance, if you have a hostile or unfamiliar audience with the topic or subject matter, maybe you use primacy because you're going to hit them with the most important relevant information first. So primary first. You're giving it all to them right off the bat and hoping that they uh, will stick with you through the remainder of the speech or presentation. Then you have recency, where maybe you have a familiar or uh, more positive looking environment towards the topic. So you choose uh, recency, where you're giving them the most important information last, most recently, because they're willing to wait and kind of hear out your message there. Whereas versus privacy, you might need to hit them with the most important information and why they should pay attention first, because they're maybe not as willing to wait until the end of the presentation. Complexity is helpful if you're talking about a more complicated subject where you need to handle the building blocks 
of the subject first before you can go up into the more uh, comprehensive or challenging aspect of a topic. So you didn't get to college before going to kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, and then college, right? So you have to build up to that and maybe use complexity in those kinds of situations. Or even backwards, if you're telling us about a complex process that's understood, and then you're telling the audience about how that process was achieved or worked towards something along those lines. The next organizational pattern is spatial, and this is about space. So it's a location and distance. So oftentimes people use spatial organization when talking about things like a remodel or giving directions, um, locating things like here's an image of UW's campus, so giving directions on where to go in the campus. Um, giving directions or explaining something in terms of the body, so maybe working from the head to the toes, how something is affected, a disease, whatnot, maybe from the inside out you could do in terms of engines, technology, the body again. So spatial is really cool um, and fits uh, some speeches very well and makes uh, the message really interesting if you can apply spatial correctly and do it well. The next one we'll talk about and last one for informative speaking is cause and effect. So this presents a situation or a problem. So if that helps you to think about what a cause is, it's the situation or problem, and then discusses the effects. So for example, at the end of my speech, the audience will be able to identify two effects student loans have on students. And your central idea might be something like students have lifelong Student loans have lifelong implications on students. So here I'm going to tell you the cause or the problem and situation in main point one. Student loans are easy to obtain but have lifelong implications. And then my support under that main point, excuse me, would tell you uh, what those implications are, what those lifelong implications are. Main point two then says an effect. Students with loans may be delayed in buying a house, then you'll have support for that. And another effect, um, half of students file for bankruptcy by the age of 45. So an example there of cause and effect informing us about a problem. Effect cause, you can also flip it around where you present the situation or the problem and then seek the causes of said situation. So example here, at the end of my speech the audience will be able to explain the two reasons students do not attend class. Uh, the central idea might be something like students fail to attend class for two primary reasons. So you're going to give us the situation, the problem, students are hesitant to attend class. The cause, one may be attending class requires earlier bedtimes. Another cause might be attending class means assignments must be completed uh, by that date so students just aren't going to class if they don't have the assignment done kind of thing. But you would explain that all in the sub points. Uh, but there you've really organized your message and have a thought process about how you're addressing um, the problem situation and your support for that situation. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move on to organization for persuasive presentations. We'll talk about problem solution, criteria satisfaction, comparative advantages, and the motivated sequence. I'm going to add one more in here that is not in your textbook called refutation. And we did use refutation in public speaking as well, so you'll have a heads up there too. Okay, so the first one is problem solution. And guys, this one is actually very, very simple, but kind of gets us hung up a little bit in terms of organization at times. So here you are directly talking about a problem and then directly offering the solution to that problem. So the main points in the body of your speech here should literally be main point one, obviously in a complete sentence, discusses the overall problem, and then your subpoints are going to be very detailed and describe the problem holistically. So you're probably going to have a lot of levels of subpoints. Then your solution is going to directly address those problems that you brought up in the first main point and be equally as detailed. So for example, if you presented three aspects of a larger problem, Maybe that's A, B, and C in your outline. And then in your solution, you have A, B, and C that directly addresses and solves each of those problems. So two overall main points in problem solution with very detailed subpoints. Example here, uh, the government wastes tax money. Solution, vote for me, and I will find ways to fix this problem within our state. And then you would talk about A, B, and C to solve A, B, and C that you had brought up above, something along those lines. 
This, guys, this organizational pattern is great for your sales presentations, discussing a problem and offering a solution. Simple organization, but it takes time to figure out how that, all, how that support breaks down within these overall main points. All right, next one we'll talk about is criteria satisfaction. So this sets up a criteria the audience will accept and shows how your ideas meet the criteria. So here is an example with Verizon. So introduction here sets up the criteria. It sets up the criteria about how you, or what criteria you are trying to meet uh, within that company. So example, a cell phone carrier must have low rates, a strong signal, and reliable customer service. So there we can see our central idea is a blueprint. It's giving us the points to come. Verizon has the lowest rates in Laramie. Verizon has the nation's, nation's largest network and signal system. Verizon has 4,000 customer service representatives in the United States. So already in our intro, we see the criteria that the audience wants, and then you are providing and supporting that your business, your company, uh, your group has, has met that criteria, even exceeds that criteria in our main points. So you can also do this where you give all of the criteria in main point one, kind of like problem solution, and then you satisfy that criteria in main point two like this. Okay, so there's a couple examples, a couple of ways to do uh, criteria satisfaction. The next organizational pattern we'll talk about is comparative advantage. So this puts several alternatives side by side to show what is best. Um, you'll often do this, I think, when you're looking at uh, technology. So buying a computer or something, buying a cell phone even, you're comparing which brand is better, which phone is better for your value, um, and you're comparing side by side, probably have several windows open, even like buying a car, those kinds of things. So you automatically do this. We do this as humans in nature when we're making uh, big purchases, but you can also apply those same principles within a speech. So again, putting several art alternatives side by side to show what is best. So the intro, you have several choices, but here you can see that A, for instance, is the best. So A does this compared to B, then you're going to support that under that main point. Do it again here, A does this compared to B, do it again in main point three, A does this compared to B. So showing three reasons why one is better than the other. And you notice here I've built in, even in these uh, very brief examples, uh, that I built in parallel structure. So I said A does this compared to B, and I would, I would explain further, obviously. But I did the same language, used the same language throughout main points one, two, and three, and that helps build in that redundancy as well and keeps the audience on track, especially when you're adding in more technical language and a lot of support for each main point. So example here, uh, there are many gyms in Laramie, so you must do a comparison to see that Tough Guys, if that were a real gym, is the best choice. So main point one, Tough Guys is open longer than other gyms, so then you would support um, under there comparatively to other gyms. Main point two, Tough Guys has more exercise machines than any other gym in town. Main point three, Tough Guys has more activities than any other gym in town, including basketball, racquetball, pool, and asana. So conclusion here, you're going to summarize what you talked about and then reiterate that Tough Guys has the highest comparative value in Laramie. Okay. Then we'll talk about Monroe's motivated sequence here. Um, and this is the organizational pattern that is often used in infomercials. So they're gaining your attention. They're telling you that you are missing something and you need this product in your life typically. Then how that product satisfies that need. And then visualizing how that product uh, would work and fix or improve your life. And then asking you to actually buy that product, typically in infomercials, asking for action. So again, you can see here where this would fit really well uh, with your sales presentation, working through the actual selling process that is used in infomercials and applying it um, to our class as well. So we'll watch an example of uh, the Snuggy infomercial, and then we'll talk about how this could be applied, uh, how this uh, organizational pattern is applied in that specific infomercial. You want to keep warm when you're feeling chilled, but you don't want to raise your heating bill. Blankets are okay, but they can slip and slide. And when you need to reach for something, your hands are trapped inside. Now, there's the Snuggie, the blanket that has sleeves. The Snuggie keeps you totally warm and gives you the freedom to use your hands. So now, you can work the remote or read a book in total warmth and comfort. Use your laptop without being cold 
or enjoy a snack while staying snugly warm. Snuggy is made of ultra soft, thick, luxurious fleece with oversized sleeves so you can move your arms and use your hands and still be wrapped in warm. Super large, one size fits all, so you can stay warm from head to toe. No more cold feet. And with Snuggy, you can get up and still stay warm. Perfect for men, women, and children, too. The ultra soft fleece keeps you totally warm, and the sleeves keep your hands free. So you can snuggle your baby in your arms or keep your pet close at hand. Perfect for chilly outdoor evenings, staying cozy and warm at sporting events. And it's ideal for those drafty dorm rooms. The Snuggy is machine washable, so you'll get years of warmth and comfort. Now you can use your remote, enjoy a snack, talk on the phone, do what you need to, and stay totally warm with the Snuggy. Similar products sell for up to $60, but call now and you'll get the ultra soft, ultra warm Snuggy for only $14.95. Available in royal blue, sage green, and burgundy. As an added bonus, you'll also receive our compact press and open book light. Just press and the book light instantly opens and turns on for extra light where you need it. A $15 value free. Yes, you get the ultra soft fleece Snuggy and our press and open book light. A $75 value, both for only $14.95. To order, call 1 800 819 0658. Remember, you'll get the ultra soft, ultra warm Snuggy in the comp. All right, guys, so there you can see that they gained our attention right away in that infomercial. They established that we have a need for the Snuggy, right? We can't read a book, we can't hold a baby, you can't stay warm at the same time, really, is the premise of the Snuggy, right? Then they said, but we have this new amazing product that fixes all of those problems. That's the satisfaction. Then they go into visualizing how you can do all of those same activities without having to take your blanket off or dealing with it. Um, and then the end is the action. So they want you to actually call in and buy the Snuggie. So used often in commercials, the Snuggie is a very um, easy and somewhat funny example to talk about in terms of Monroe's motivated sequence. You can also use this with um, more serious topics obviously, like we will be doing in our class, and um, even like advocating that somebody volunteer for a specific uh, group or organization in order to solve a problem and visualizing how that could be helpful to not only them, but also the community, those kinds of things. So Monroe's Motivated Sequence holds a really strong applicability in lots of different uh, settings. So here is another example or more of how you would set things up in terms of Monroe's motivated sequence. So your introduction would be where you gain attention. The body, main point one, would be the, uh, the need for change, so the problem. Number two, main point two, would be the satisfaction, the solution there. Three would be visualization. I, I like to think about this as the benefits of the solution. So picture how the solution will work for the audience. And the, then the conclusion is the action. So closing the deal, asking for money, asking for action, asking for volunteers, etc. All right, our last persuasive organizational pattern is reputation, and again, this is not in your book, but this is where you anticipate the listener's key objectives to your proposal, and then you address those objections. Um, so oftentimes this is used in politics where you'll say, my opponent says this, this, and this, or this is largely believed to be true, and then in your next main point, you refute that with your own facts, your own beliefs, um, and you say, in fact, this is actually the truth or this is actually what happened this is actually what um, should be largely considered true uh, by most people so again you're addressing what most people largely think and then providing the facts to refute what what the commonly held belief is and there's two ways you can do it here this is the most common where you provide everything that uh, someone else believes and then provide your own uh, version of those things your own refutation and main point two you can also do it where you provide um, what the uh, what the commonly held belief is for others as the main point, and then you refute that in the subpoints, provide the next commonly held belief in main point two, refute that in the subpoints, so on and so forth. But again, this is the most common, and I think the easiest um, to think about and apply in terms of refutation, that is. All right, so now we'll go back into organizing the body holistically now that we have all those patterns in our head. So rules for main points, again, just like our central idea, we want to be sure that our main points are stated as claims, so no phrases there, no questions there. 
We want to develop our thesis with our main points. So I would say you're elaborating on uh, the buzzword that you indicated in your central idea in your blueprint. So you're giving us, putting that in a whole sentence. So I like to think of it as the umbrella statement for what is to come into the support. So the support under your main point is where the details are, where the meat is, and your main point is just kind of introducing and elaborating on what is to come there. We also want to use minimum of two main points and I would say maximum of five main points in your speech just to be able to keep the audience on track. Two main points to have enough information to support and then no more than five main points. That just gets a little heavy and we want to make sure that we are organizing as best as possible. State and parallel structure, like we talked about earlier, that will really help your audience stay on track in terms of main points especially. And being sure that each tidbit that we share, especially main points, only contain one idea. And then knowing that we'll provide support for that idea below. So trying to keep it to one sentence, knowing that you can elaborate in those set points. Okay, so we have our body planned, we have the top of the page planned, now we'll go into planning the introduction. So first of all, we know that we need to gather the audience's attention right away. The first thing that we say is considered the attention getter. So jump right in with what you have planned there. Again, first thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer this home, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is considered the attention getter. So saying, all right, so, or even introducing yourself, sometimes uh, that can set the tone and the stage for the, the presentation. So remembering the first utterance that you, that you say in a presentation in a speech is going to be what gains their attention. Also in the introduction, we want to give the audience a reason to listen. So we're going to tell them why this information is important and imperative to them. We're going to set the tone for the topic and setting because we've done all that audience consideration, audience analysis, and that's not only done before the speech, it's also included in the introduction of the speech, and we need to continuously consider our audience as we structure the support in the body of the speech, right? You're going to establish your qualifications as a speaker to speak on the topic. So for instance, going back to my simple chocolate chip cookie example, it might be that I've been baking these chocolate chip cookies with this exact recipe with my grandma since I was old enough to help stir the batter, right? Then you get into more complicated procedures and more complicated information. And there you might say you've been an expert in this field for so long. You might say that you have degrees in this field. You might say you've done extensive research. So you always want to establish why you are credible to speak on that topic. You also want to introduce your thesis, that central idea, and provide a preview in the introduction. And if you combine and do that blueprint, you'll kill two birds with one stone, and that should just be the last sentence of your introduction. Moving on to conclusions here. Um, so types of opening statements, and these will often tie to your conclusion. You can ask a question. You can ask a rhetorical question. You can ask for an overt response. You can tell a story. Uh, maybe you don't provide the answer to your question, and then you answer that in your conclusion. Maybe you start your story, and you kind of weave it through uh, your speech. Maybe you start the story in the intro and answer or finish the story in the conclusion. Uh, maybe you present a quote to start your speech, that's your attention getter, and you reference that quote again to close. Maybe you make a startling statement and reference it again in the conclusion. So oftentimes, guys, that attention getter is really a great reference to kind of bookend it and close as well. Uh, planning the introduction and conclusion here, there's lots of types of opening statements, so just continuing our discussion. You can refer to the audience and establish that connection right away in your attention getter. You can reference the occasion, which might be very, very beneficial depending on the situation. You can use humor towards the topic, occasion, audience, etc. Always being cautious and careful that your humor is suitable for that situation. Our conclusions, guys, the first thing we want to do is review our thesis, review our central idea. We want to summarize our main points. We're going to tell them what we told them, again, one more time in the conclusion. And then that closing statement that we just talked about uh, where we can create that favorable impression, give a sense of completion, and oftentimes it works best to tie back to that attention getter. Okay, guys, now we're going to look at our example in the modules that you can fall back on as you start to create uh, these preparation outlines for your presentations. 
Okay guys, so I'm here in the how to structure and organize a speech outline module and this is right underneath your chapter 9 lecture module where you're watching this video. So go in here and download this how to write and organize a speech outline document that I provided for you here. And the first page that you will see in this Word document um, explains what should be in each part of the outline. Um, so here it's going to tell you exactly what you should include. So starts with the phrase, at the end of my speech, the audience will be able to. Then you can go to the second page and you see an actual example of these concepts applied. So here we see this specific purpose, at the end of my speech, the audience will be able to identify, again using one of those active measurable verbs. Okay, then we can scroll back up here. It reminds you what your central idea is. Again, it's that thesis statement. And then you can scroll down here and see an example of a central idea. And guys, this is a very brief outline, but it shows you all of the necessary elements there. You can look in the introduction to see all of those things. And what this one might be lacking a little bit is that strong credibility statement. Uh, this is a very introductory speech, but you can still see all of the pieces and parts here and then elaborate to fit to fit your needs uh, within our class. So I'm uh, not giving away exactly how I want you to do your own presentations because I want to see your creativity and how you approach things here. But in terms of outline formatting, you have that here with this basic intro. And again, guys, if you ever have questions or want me to look over your outlines, I'm happy to do so if you send them my way. Just give me a good chunk of time so I can review them probably about 24 hours at least before um, deadlines. But this is here for you. tells you exactly what you need to include in the intro, what you need to include in the conclusion, um, where you need to put signposts, those transitional statements, all that good stuff. You can see even here we're going to be as detailed as main points are indicated with capital Roman numerals. Uh, the first level subpoints are with A, B. And guys, if I were to indent again here, I would indent under here and it would be 1, 2. So the number is 1 and 2. Again, you always have to support each main point with at least two sources. So remembering all of those things that you've learned in public speaking in terms of outlining, applying it here with a lot more organizational options. Again, Monroe's motivated sequence and problem solution are great for your sales presentation. And then relying on those uh, informative patterns for your career research project coming up. Okay, so we'll go back and finish a couple more slides in our lecture, and then you will be ready to uh, tackle chapter nine. Finishing up with intros and conclusions here, we've talked about this using techniques to tie back to your attention getter um, in terms of closing statements, um, in terms of gaining attention. You can return to your theme from your opening statement. You can appeal to action, so actually including that call to action, what you want the audience to know and do after uh, the speech. You can end with a challenge, which is also always fun. So thinking about ways that you can really appeal to your audience, always, always considering the audience in every step of our speech making process of our presentations. So again, types of closing statements, you can refer to the attention getter, refer to the opening theme, appeal for action, end with a challenge. <clears throat> we also want to add transitions, so those are our signposts. They help promote clarity and they re-emphasize those important ideas that we've introduced right away in that central idea with that blueprint or with a preview statement. And it really keeps listeners interested because they're going back and hearing the same words over and over again, which helps them feel that they are following the speech and they find that clarity and that emphasis very helpful. Again, you as the presenter have probably reviewed the information many, many times before you are presenting, so it may sound redundant to you. But remember that the audience is hearing this information for the very first time, so having that redundancy uh, really, really helps. And they don't have like a written document typically to refer back to because oral communication is in the now. So we want to make sure that um, our ideas are very clear and the main ones are emphasized many times. Lastly, guys, with characteristics of transitions, we want to refer to the preceding and the upcoming ideas. And this is specifically within our main points especially. So you always want to review what you have just talked about and preview the next. So back to my chocolate chip cookie example, you might say something like, now that we've talked about all the ingredients that you need to make cookies, let's move on to how we mix up these ingredients. 
We also need to bridge between two points, which you can see referring to the preceding and um, hinting at the upcoming will help them see the connection there. And you want to call attention to themselves. So call attention that this is a transition. And you can often do this with delivery as well. Maybe if you shift or you move to a different point, even in online, you're shifting from one side of the screen to the other. In person, you're moving to show that you are transitioning between ideas, um, all those things. Okay, we learned a lot today in terms of how we prepare for a presentation, going back to even considering the audience before we start preparing, how we should tackle the body first and figure out how all of our information fits into a certain organizational pattern, and then going back and seeing how we can most creatively connect to our audience with the introduction and tie that conclusion back in. So. Tackle the chapter 9 quiz. Chapter 10 is coming shortly. Um, and as always, as I always end my lectures, email me with any questions, please. I'm here to help.